Good afternoon to every, everyone. I am Pavni. I am here to discuss the topic titled Collaboration in Public Construction, Contractual Incentives, Partnering Schemes and Trust. So, contract is actually the uh, formal written agreement between the parties to perform a certain task within the specifications and time and budget constraints and which can be enforceable by law. So, this uh, contracts are usually designed by the client and pre-contractual communication is usually restricted. And the opportunities for negotiation and possibilities to select the contractor on subjective criteria is always limited in public setting. So uh, there are several types of contracts are present, but usually uh, lump sum contracts are considered as the traditional contracts. In traditional contracts, uh, in, in this lump sum contracts, the total cost of performing the activity is always fixed. So this often leads to conflicts between the parties due to distress, mm, sorry, distrust and uh, presence of uncertainties. So there is, it is always complex to establish and maintain collaboration between the parties. So uh, there is one analogy that the contract is always uh, required, uh, is only needed when there is lack of trust. So the relationship between truck, um, trust, collaboration and contract is ambiguous and contradicted. So there is one aspect of uh, building uh, contract is, uh, this contract serves to increase the mutual understanding of the trust, uh, terms of exchange, also provides opportunities for building interpersonal relationships. The extren extensive contracts will improve uh, the joint learning process rather than distrust. So there are uh, several initiatives have been taken by the client to improve the cooperation with the contractors. One of the major thing is promoting partnering. So in, part in partnering, it is nothing but a relational contracting. So in which uh, uh, there are several uh, specific uh, tools are there, uh, like uh, selection processes, can, they can uh, opt for continuous improvement programs, they can include, and financial incentives they can pro uh, incorporate in the contracting system. So here, uh, the three major uh, financial incentives that are in incorporated in partnering are discussed here. One is uh, alliance contract. So in alliance contract, um, the, uh, it encompasses joint uh, budgeting, joint budgeting and uh, um, commitment to cost uh, and budget targets and risk, sh risk sharing between the parties and bonus system. In partnering, uh, it, the, the cost incentives are, uh, uh, are in the form of target cost uh, uh, contracts. The tie between performance to compensation, so this cannot be done uh, when there is a uh, difference in establishing the fire, uh, fair process uh, uh, targets. The major aim of uh, this partnering is to relate contract and trust so that uh, the parties can be um, can signal to trustworthiness and opportunity they will they will get the opportunities to uh, improve their jo joint learning. So these have been studied with three case studies. The first case study is the construction of a rail project. Um, the uh, second case study is the road maintenance project in Netherlands. The third case study is the cons uh, host hospital construction in Sweden. Sweden. For the first case study, uh, they have op first they have uh, opted for a design built uh, contract, but they have identified that it, this project is uh, associate associated with high heavy risks, high risks. So then uh, they have converted. Uh, they have opt for alliance contract than the uh, DB contract, in which in alliance contract, uh, the major modification from the DB contract is here, they opt for uh, risk sharing. So in risk sharing, they have uh, the both client and contractor have uh, 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 separated out some amount called alliance fund. So uh, from that amount, they will be sending, uh, spending uh, that alliance fund for risks when the, whenever they occur risks and design and management. And uh, in the second case study, uh, they wanted to have an innovat innovative uh, contract method in which they have given 60% weightage to the uh, quality report that has been submitted by the bidders and 40% weightage to the uh, price that is quoted by the bidder. And they have chosen the uh, best uh, the contractor for that particular uh, project based on these uh, the suitable, um, based on the criteria mentioned above. And for the third case study, so uh, see for hospital construction, there will be uh, for any project there will be uh, several parties involved in the uh, project. Like uh, architect, design contractor will be there. The design contractor will be there. Uh, structural engineering will be there. Electrical contractor and uh, building contractor, HVAC supplier, and all. So they have uh, uh, 
they have entered into a separate contract with each and every party and they have set a target cost for each and every party and they mentioned um, gain uh, they share they will share the gains and pains uh, equally among the client and both contractor uh, depending upon the target cost so this is one uh, so this is also a type of uh, a modified version of alliance contract so for analyzing the uh, effectiveness of partnering so the framework has three dimensions one is formal contract argument uh, arrangements collaborative arrangements and relational development if you see the formal contract arrangements of kca see uh, they have uh, formulated uh, alliance fund so that uh, the uh, both contractor and client both will share the risks equally and for the in the case uh, second case study so they have uh, uh, mentioned in the contract documents that the contractor will only take up the routine maintenance part and uh, client will be uh, responsible for variable maintenance and they have uh, also developed a uh, uh, system oriented contract management so that uh, which will monitor the contract performance according to the client's uh, quality improvement uh, according to the quality that is managed by the client in performing the work and in the case third case study uh, they have a separate uh, contract for each party and they have set the targets for each and every party and for collaborative arrangements in the kca so they uh, they haven't uh, performed any meetings or reviews uh, to improve the collaboration between the client and contractor but they have set up their uh, workplaces at a single location so that they'll be meeting uh, uh, as and when required and in the case b uh, they have performed um, they have uh, signed a partnering agreement they have performed some meetings workshop to uh, improve the collaboration between client and contractor but that has not achieved for the third case study they have uh, conducted workshops review meetings and feedback system to improve the uh, collaborative collaboration between client and contractor for the relational development since the both parties in uh, case study a are located in a single place it was well coordinated if they have if the contractor has any issues with the uh, client he is uh, um, easily uh, can able to meet and uh, resolve that issue there itself but whereas in the second case in the uh, case study b the there was a uh, miscommunication has uh, us usually happened between the contractor and client so which leads to distress and for this uh, third case there was a um, since the uh, each contractor has a uh, target fixed by them and gains and pains are shared so they were uh, working um, they have achieved trustworthiness so if we uh, analyze these three case studies so the first case study is a successful collaboration the second case study is unsuccessful one because uh, there was a lack of uh, understanding between uh, the client and contractor uh, because uh, the contractor and client were unable to understand what routine maintenance means and what vari variable maintenance means and for the third one it is though it is successful it has some uh, limitations that there were some unclear resp uh, there un responsibilities were unclear between the client and contractor due to if there is any price variation occurred uh, for performing some particular um, work the uh, client uh, the contractor thought the client will uh, modify the agreement but the uh, client hasn't taken any uh, measures but still the contractors uh, has performed their work according to the uh, target that is set by the client thank you okay thanks for uh, the elaborate presentation i'm going to touch upon a few uh, highlights because we have about 15 more odd minutes um, first of all i think the normally i give about two or three readings per class but this week was five because Negotiation is one of those topics where there's just so much to read about uh, that it's sort of very difficult to compress it into a few um, sort of readings. Um, I took a class on, uh, or actually I was TAing a class on negotiation at Stanford, which there's a professor called Stan Christensen, who was a professional negotiator, took. And a lot of what I learned from about negotiation came from sitting in on uh, that class, right? And I've tried to distill some of this uh, into the readings that I gave you. Um, maybe I'll just sort of start very quickly with the one that Pavani presented um, and because uh, I just want to address one or two points here and then move on to the other ones. We talked I think in the last class or the class before that there are two kinds of stakeholders, right? So there are people who are 
um, and then Johan uses this external versus internal classification. There are people like your customers or uh, people whose houses are going to, you know, uh, people who are going to be displaced and resettled, environmental groups, all of these are stakeholders who are uh, somewhat peripheral to the project. And then there are these internal stakeholders who are your contractors, uh, who are your designers, etc. Right? So are the, your direct customers and so on. So you have people who are actually playing a very key role in developing that project versus a number of people who are also affected on that project. So the idea behind this reading is that we actually start talking also about, and when we say stakeholders, Normally, the first thing that comes to a lot of people's minds is the, uh, the NGOs, the uh, population, uh, the, the residents who are being displaced, the government agencies, and we often do not think of people within the project as uh, stakeholders, but they also need to be uh, you know, managed, right? because everyone's success is tied together. In this case, uh, for the internal stakeholders, there is actually a relationship in the form of a contract. Right? So you have a contract that you write which determines behavior. Right? And that contract, but the point is that things can change all the time. Right? So, you know, example, you are building a metro rail, you have a lot of steel that you are going to put in, you submit an estimate for your project, it is uh, 500 crores and you have a certain budget for steel, but because of no fault of your own, steel prices rise up. Okay? So, what happens in that case? Right? Because if, you, if the client continues to pay you 500 crores, steel prices have gone up, right? you are going to not make money. Right? So, very often in an adversarial regime, the client will say that is your risk. Right? You should have figured that out right? or you should have put in a buffer whatever, that is your risk. Very often contracts have something called a price escalation clause, which allows for a little bit of escalation, but that is often within a narrow band. Sometime because of, sometimes because of global um, you know, perturbations, the prices might increase far beyond that. Steel in the Delhi metro by the way is exactly one such example. So, an adversarial regime, you will say it is your problem. Right, so, the contractor then has to deal with their problem. So, one of their ways of dealing with it might be to say, look, I am going to make a loss on this project anyway, right, because I am bound by the contract, the courts will uphold whatever these guys say. So, I am just going to put my, the worst quality people I have in my organization on this project, because I am not going to make a profit anyway, and take the best people that I need, right, that I have, and put them on other projects where I might be profitable. Right? So, this could be one kind of response that the contractor brings to the table. What that does is, you know, you as a client, you stuck to your guns and said, I will only pay 500 crores, not a penny more, not a penny less. Uh, but it might adversely affect your project, because because of that decision, you actually get poor quality people, and the work drags out, and you know, all of that. There are other hidden costs, there is bad PR in the press, etc. Right? So, it becomes important that when these kinds of things happen, you negotiate. Right? So, obviously, you can't just, you may not be able to pick up the entire tab, but essentially you need to negotiate. And in order to negotiate, you have to have a contractual framework that allows you to negotiate. Because if we say fixed price contract and we sign the contract, then where is the negotiation? We have already agreed that these terms are fixed. Right? So, there are a whole variety of contracts, which we call, you know, broadly relational contracts or alliance contracts that allow people to negotiate. Right? The very common you know, function between them is they have what they call pain share versus gain share clauses, where they say, look, if the project is successful, we all benefit. If the project is not successful, we all lose. Right? And therefore, if I am personally going to make a loss because the price of steel is going up, right? uh, that, and the project is actually going to go over budget, then according to this kind of contract, everyone gets affected. Right? Everyone shares that penalty. Right? So, what kind of response can you expect in this case? Right? One response that you might expect is the designers might come in and say, you know what, we can redesign so that we have lesser steel in this project. Right? We can put in more reinforced concrete right? or bring in other kinds of building materials right? so that the costs do not overshoot. So, now you actually have innovative solutions coming up because you are allowed to negotiate. Right? So, I think it is important to also understand that negotiation can happen within the project organization. Contracts are very important because they set the parameters on which negotiation can happen. And there are these kinds of contracts, relational contracts and the examples that uh, Pavani gave, uh, there were a couple of examples where people use the relationality to have a discussion right? and say, uh, you know, can we change something. So, a good example just outside our IIT uh, Madras campus is this uh, research park. Behind Research Park is something called Ramanuja Mighty SEZ, right? Literally, the building next to Research Park. Okay, uh, was built by or, or owned by a, an organization called Tata Realty, uh, and Tata Realty used uh, uh, a contractor called Leighton from Australia, right? And gave them a relational contract, right? What that meant was that Leighton was able to say, look, this is to the architect. This is very nice, but this is going to be a pain to construct, 
uh, right? Because you have its nice architectural facades, but when you try to engineer it, it's going to cost a lot of time and a lot of money, right? So how about redesigning it so that, I mean, you don't have to make it a box, you can still make it somewhat iconic, but redesigning it with constructability in mind. So in this case, so there's a trade-off, right? Just like the Gunia chicken exercise. Look, I, as an architect, I want an iconic building, right? I want people to come back and say, have you seen that building? And so, and that's sort of what increases my value, right? As a contractor, I want something that's very easy to construct, right? Both of these are often opposites, right? But if you have a contract that allows people to discuss, perhaps you can find a middle ground as they did, right? So I think that's the purpose of that article, okay? So negotiation is important even internally, okay? Let's go back to Alex's article because I think it has two very important, um, where is this? Here we go. Yeah. So you drew these yourselves, Alex? Fantastic. Thanks. I like that creativity. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is one of the key sort of building blocks of negotiation. So the point is when you go into a negotiation, internal, external, etc. right? So you want your gunia chicken egg. You want uh, a design that needs to be more constructible, right? So you want whatever, right? You're going into a negotiation. You want environmentalists to agree that you should, that you can, you know, lay a road through this forest or dig a well or whatever it is, okay? You've got to do a little bit of preparation, right? You just don't go into a negotiation and start shouting, hoping that you'll outshout the other person. What's the kind of preparation that you do? These things here, right, in this uh, diagram are essentially the points that you do your homework on, okay? So the center is BATNA, right, which is this here, right, best alternative to a negotiated agreement. That's where, that's where the BATNA comes from, right, best alternative to negotiated agreement, right. What does BATNA mean? In simple terms, what's BATNA? If I can someone sort of give me a lay person's definition of what BATNA is. Exactly. It's sort of your opportunity cost, right. What's your alternative? Right, what's out there? So it could, this could be, I mean, if I go buy a television set, right, if I'm looking at, if, so if I don't buy this, then what's my alternative, right? So if we don't build this, um, you know, dam, what is the alternative, right? So if I don't get the chicken gunia egg, what is the alternative, right? And very, it's, it's, it's very important to go and understand what the other person's alternative is, right? So that you can understand where, so from BATNA you get another sort of acronym, which people call the zone of possible agreement or the ZOPA, right, which is, where is, what is the scope for you guys to agree on something, okay? So, you know, let's say you're a contractor trying to negotiate price with me, right? So you feel you're a really good contractor and so you want to build something at 150 crores and you want me to pay it 150 crores, okay? Now, if I have a contractor who is perhaps, I mean, may not be the number one contractor like you, but is actually pretty decent, right, well-renowned, you know, definitely has done a lot of good work, who's actually giving me a project for something like 125 crores, giving me the same project 125 crores, then that is my alternative, right? And it's something that you guys need to understand before you walk in to negotiate with me. You've got to understand that I have an alternative to go in with someone at 125 crores, right? So that data point then becomes very useful because one, it tells you that if your price is anywhere close to or below 125 crores, you're, you're a winner. Right? It also perhaps gives you a little bit of an idea of what you can charge for your premium. So let's say normally your brand fetches you about 10 crores, right? Because you're a you know branded, you're you're the top construction firm in India. I'm willing to pay you another 10 crores because I know you will do on time, on quality work. Right? If you know that my BATNA is 125 crores, then you know that you can probably go up to 135 and still strike a deal with me. Right? And you know that if you ask for 150, that might be a bit too much because nobody will value a brand at 25 crores in this market. Right? So the first thing you've got to understand is what are people's alternatives, right? Is there something, if I don't build this dam, what's the alternative, right? If I don't go in with this construction company, what's the alternative, right? So first step you do is you figure out what are the alternatives, right? Then you start looking at who are the real parties to the negotiation, right? So very often you have parties that are affected and parties that are brokering, right? And these are two very, very different constituencies, right? So if, for instance, you go back to the Conoco case, right, there are NGOs representing people on the ground, like local NGOs are actually affected, right? Then you have these international NGOs that in some ways are trying to broker a deal, right? NSRD or NDRC or whatever that acronym was. We're trying to get these NGOs together. Got to deal with them fundamentally differently, right? And very often it's the affected parties that you want to spend, uh, you know, a lot of it, or people who actually are able to make decisions that you want to actually spend time on rather than people who are just conveying information back and forth but are a party to the negotiation, right? So one example here, for instance, is when I was trying to get uh, 
licenses for the software called Primavera, right? All of you are aware of Primavera, we use it for project planning. We don't have, we didn't have Primavera installed in our departmental computer facility. So I was talking to this uh, person. So Primavera is an American company. They had this licensed uh, reseller uh, here who was their sort of a uh, person that would, was licensed to sell this in India. So we had these discussions with this, uh, with this person and it, uh, you know, the price that they were charging, right, was way higher than what I thought we should pay. In fact, my argument was we should pay nothing, right, you should give it to us for free because if I train all of my civil engineers, there are 100 B techs and I don't know whatever 30, 40, 50 odd M techs, right, if I can train 150 people every year, some of whom are going to the workforce knowing Primavera, they are going to put pressure on their managers to get them Primavera and your scale sales will skyrocket. Right, so it's your incentive to give me the software for free, right, in order for your business to boom. I mean, what's the point of giving me some educational license, right, and possibly losing the deal where you could give this for free. And by the way, many people do it, right, that's the reason Autodesk gives software for free, right, and, and most of the other service providers are uh, following suit at least in the BIM world, right. The idea is let's catch you guys now and hook you on to say Revit. So when you go to the workforce and your employer says, look, I need someone to build a model, you'll say, I can do it, you need to buy me Revit, right. And all of a sudden, Autodesk might get a, uh, you know, a corporate license, right, which would be far val more valuable than, you know, selling it to universities. So this was my pitch. But these guys were having none of it, right. They said, no, this is the minimum that we can sell for. And then it struck me that I'm negotiating with the wrong party, right. These guys are probably getting their, you know, paying a license fee to Primavera based on which they are trying to retail it and make maybe a marginal profit, right. So for them to give it to me for free means that they are making a loss, right. Who should I be talking to? I need to be talking to Primavera. I need to be talking to those guys saying, look, you are the guys who are going to benefit, right. So let's cut out the middle person here. Why don't you strike an academic deal with me just the way you strike a deal with possibly most of the other academic institutes, right. So understanding who you are negotiating with and what their incentives are, right, is important. You know, I have all of this understanding of theory and I could just not get past uh, this resell, right, despite all using all the negotiation tactics in the book until I realized that boss, I am negotiating with the wrong person, right. So parties, what are their interests, right. So all of these are very important questions that you really, it is like a systematic, it is like an assignment, right. You go in and say, this is the party, what is their BATNA, right, can I do some research and write a paragraph on that parties, interests, etc. right. What kinds of barriers, right, are there? Are there, for instance, uh, you know, cultural barriers here, um, right, that are preventing this kind of, uh, uh, you know, negotiation from uh, happening. I don't know, for instance, uh, if you look at, uh, look, we are running out of water, right. I need to treat water, right, and Singapore and other places have shown us that you can treat water and drink it, right. So I need to be able to negotiate with you and convince you to pay for wastewater. Right. And you are looking at me saying pay for wastewater, I mean you must pay me for consuming this wastewater, right. I will pay you if you give me fresh water. So this is sort of a, you know, very caricaturized version of this debate on water, uh, you know, that is going on. So how do you actually, so here the barrier in some senses is also cultural, right. In the sense nobody really, particularly in the Indian context, uh, you know, can re really think about drinking recycled water, right. It is like, you know, you are dr dr drinking refuse, waste. Uh, you know, all kinds of things are in this water, how could you possibly drink it, despite the fact that from a technical perspective, BOD, COD, TDS, all your, uh, you know, uh, environmental parameters are being met, right. So it is important to understand, so there is no point saying, oh, BATNA, there is no BATNA, we are running out of water, right. Uh, these are exactly the people who we need, because these are exactly the people we need to negotiate with, they are running out, with, or out of water, it is easy, right. So you guys do not have water, I am giving you water, pay me for it, right. But there are sort of ethical barriers here. People might actually be willing, the, the BATNA might be hidden, right. You are supplying water for uh, 10 rupees a kiloliter. People might be willing to pay 20, 30, 40, 50 rupees a kiloliter to get water from a lake or a river that is far, far away just because of that psychological barrier. So you are comparing, oh, the BATNA is 50 rupees a kiloliter. I am giving it to you at 10 rupees a kiloliter. It is a winner, right. But you have not factored in the ethics uh, or the, sorry, the, the cultural barriers of the negotiation. So this to me is a very, very critical part of uh, negotiation is you go in. So if you understand all of this, right, then it is very possible that you can actually arrive at a solution. So if you had, for instance, really understood this for the, the game that we played, you would more or less have understood that that person wanted the white of the egg or the yolk of the egg, right. If you had done a systematic analysis in this sort of manner, in which case the negotiation would have concluded very quickly, right. So this is one thing that is sort of extremely, uh, you know, important for, the, for negotiation. 
Um, this is the, the three E's are also I think uh, need to spend a minute talking about this because the thing about negotiation is that process matters, it is not the outcome. Right? For those of you who did the reading, you will remember this nice story about this lady who gets caught uh, and needs to go and gets a ticket and needs to go to court right, to contest the ticket. Right? So, she has this elaborate uh, defense that she prepares, she goes to court and the judge more or less says, oh you know fine, you do not have to pay, you are fine. Right? So, she gets the outcome she wanted, right? she did not want to pay, the, pay for the ticket, she wanted to go to court. Uh, and contest it and even before she opened her mouth the, uh, the judge awarded in her favor right and yet that person is unhappy right why is that person unhappy the person is unhappy because why is she unhappy well not so much that she had to go through this much of trouble uh, yeah so she so she did all this preparation she wanted to sort of win the case right she wanted to sort of argue it and win it not just be handed it on a platter which now sort of seems like a false kind of victory, it is not about the outcome at all, right? it is about the process. So, the lesson is sometimes the right outcome with the wrong process as in this case does not feel good, the wrong outcome with the right process sometimes does not feel bad. right? Uh, how many of you voted uh, in an election recently, state or national last, how many of you have voted? Okay, some I thought you guys were all, you guys are yet not old enough to vote I guess. Okay. All right, for those of you who voted, how many of you in your constituency or whichever you voted for, how many of you voted for the winning person? Okay. So, how many of you voted totally raise your hands? Okay. How many of you voted for the winning person? So, the person you voted for won. Okay. So, for those of you who voted for the person you lost, are you upset? Right. So, elections are, are, a, are a good way of saying look, personally I did not vote for the person who stood in my constituency, I mean who won in my constituency. Right. Uh, so, the outcome was wrong for me. But I am not upset because I sort of believe in the democratic principle, everyone voted and uh, more people voted for this other person who won and I sort of accept that choice. right? So, because there is a process right, where everyone cast their vote and you know I like to believe that it was a transparent process and there was no electoral voting machine rigging and all of that, uh, even though the outcome was something that was probably not favorable to me, I am happy to accept it because of the process. right? So, the lesson here is that the process matters and therefore, it is not about sort of saying I want my way or I want to give them what they want, it is about saying is there a is there a democratic process. Again if you go back to the Conoco example, right? the moment Conoco did that meeting uh, in that floating uh, hotel, uh, right, where they came in and said here is the uh, environmental management plan, what are your thoughts, people felt there is no process here, you guys just came up with something, how in the world are we going to go through a I do not know a 3500 page document right here and uh, you know give you any feedback. Right, so, this is just an eye wash. Okay, essentially, you are just going to sort of say check the box on public consultation and go ahead. Right? Whereas, the opposite case is where you take a blank sheet of paper and you say okay, what are the things that you would like and very often you find that when you start with that kind of an approach, not everything that is suggested may get implemented. Right? But people often tend to feel that they had a chance to give their selection, there was some process through which uh, you know ideas were uh, selected and you know maybe their idea was not part of it, but at least it went through a process and therefore, I am uh, happy with the outcome. Right? So, process becomes extremely important which means you have got to engage people, right? you have got to explain clearly what is going on and you have got to give clear expectations right, on what is going to happen. So, the more that you engage, right, so if you look at the projects that did not do so well, right? if you look at Cochabamba, if you look at um, you know Enron and Dabol, if you look at some of these other Pujagali etc., you will find that the that the engagement was either non-existent or somewhat superficial, right? On the other hand, if you look to some extent at Adyar Punga to and to a larger extent at Alandur, uh, right, etc., you see that the engagement was much higher, right? Engagement with people, better explanation, expectation, clarity, and therefore, while there may be other problems, stakeholder management is not uh, one of those, right? And maybe the last quick thing, and I'll just spend a second on this slide that Varun put up, which essentially so, so I think that when you approach a negotiation, the so first thing is to do is to approach a negotiation saying there is possibly a win-win. Then before you approach the negotiation, you sit down and you strategize, right? you figure out your batnas, your zopas, your parties, your, you go in with a strategy and the strategy is not so much for you to win. Right? The strategy is to try to see if you can get that win-win. Right? That is where you get the best negotiation outcomes. The moment you try to say you know I need to win and so therefore, let me find a strategy by which I can hoodwink others into letting me win, you will probably might get a short term agreement, but in the long term it will probably unravel. Right? So, the idea is to go in with do your research going with a plan to actually have a win-win uh, uh, you know, situation, which then means that you have to follow a process of negotiation. 
right? You'll have to you know, bring in people, bring in people on board, and this is there is actually a a, st a strategy of action, which is in this case, uh, this is the strategy that Lisa used, right? But if you look at her strategy, you'll find that she's understood the people, she's done some preparation, she started uh, joint education. So there's clearly all of these aspects of explanation, engagement, uh, you know, all of that uh, expectation, clarity. You'll find come out. Uh, through this, right? So there is, uh, you know, clearly. So, uh, so joint education series is, is certainly looking at uh, better engagement. Uh, you know, both the reframing and analyzing. So these are the kinds of preparation that she's doing, looking at underlying interests. Uh, you know, all of that. So it may not necessarily map one to one, but essentially what she's trying to do is to follow a process where she brings everybody along to the resolution, rather than say, "Here's the solution, guys. Take it or leave it," right? Or let's vote. Right, and the maximum uh, hands that go up, you know, get the get the pie or whatever. Okay, so I think this is uh, essentially the theory behind negotiation. So again, the thing is, prepare, always think win-win, right? And if you can actually bring people along in a process, then maybe that outcome is not uh, favorable to everybody, but everyone's likely to accept it, and you can actually move along with the project. Whether it's land acquisition, whether it's sort of compensation, resettlement, I think these are important. You need to impress upon people that you're displacing the value of the project, right, and why they are being sort of displaced, okay, uh, and almost get them to sort of feel that, you know, they're being displaced in a larger societal or national interest, right. At the same time, when you work out compensation packages, you need to understand what it is that you're compensating people for and try to offer them a fair compensation, uh, you know, package that affects all of that, which means not only understanding their background, but also, and, and then sort of convince people that you've gone through a process so that, yeah, maybe you're not giving as much as I wanted for my land, uh, right, but you've gone through a fair process of establishing that land value that I will agree to it. I mean, I always would like more than what you would give, but at least I'm agreeing to it, right? So I think that process becomes very important, okay? I had another game I wanted to play, but uh, we're out of time, so we'll stop here. So essentially what we've done is thought a little bit about negotiation. We'll have another exercise, right? It's called the Menihone Bay negotiation, where we'll actually do much more of a real negotiation. Menihone Bay is a development in Hawaii. Um, each of you will have a role to play. One of you will be the developer, one of you will be part of the government, couple of you will be NGOs looking at the environment, looking at uh, aquatic life, uh, this, that and the other. And you guys will have to negotiate to reach a settlement. So it will be a much more real negotiation. We will do that a little bit later. Um, that will require more than 75 minutes, right? Good. So we will stop here. I uh, will see you again tomorrow. We will talk about something else. We will talk about design thinking. Mm -hmm.